In this lecture, I'm going to take you through the changes in gender roles and the domestic division of labour. Now, when we're talking about gender roles we're, in terms of the family, we're talking about who does what within the family and how the views of that are changing. And with domestic division of labour, we're discussing um, not only housework and DIY around the house, but also decision making and who makes the decisions within the household. So we're going to look at what the traditional views are, the change, the March of Progress view is, some of the reasons why there may be changing changes in gender roles and the domestic division of labour, and then evaluate whether or not this has actually been exaggerated or whether we are becoming more equal within the family. So first of all, we'll look at the traditional roles. So these were put forward by Talcott Parsons. And you would have come across this as part of his ideas on the stabilisation of adult personalities when we talked about the functionalist view of the family. And his view was that the gender roles in the family are biological, that they have a biological um, origin and that it's not to do with society, it's external to society. We are naturally the ways that we are because of biology. So it's gender roles are not a social construction. Now, as you can imagine, the feminists are very much against this view and point out that there is actually no scientific or biological evidence to suggest that these roles are biological. And there are cultural differences around the world regarding um, gender roles. So therefore, there's more evidence to suggest that it is a social construction than it is a biologically determined role. But with Talcott Parsons, he suggested he, he was very adamant that this was a biologically determined role and that men were the rational breadwinner. They, they had the instrumental role within the family. They were the, the logical one. They were the breadwinner. So they were the one that was going out to work, bringing home the, the money, the financial stability to the family. And they were the disciplinarian. And in the era, in the 1950s and early 1960s, it wouldn't be uncommon to hear the phrase, wait until your father gets home. Um, and it was almost seen as mum might be there day to day, but dad would be the one to discipline the children should they behave in an inappropriate way. Um, so, and he referred to this as the instrumental role. The female role is more emotional and caring and domestic. And he referred to this as the expressive role. And this was to do with the idea that women, because they gave birth to children, they were more nurturing, um, the maternal instinct, if you like. And their role within the family was to act as the cushion. Um, if, um, to use a phrase from Zaretsky, who's a Marxist, but they were the kind of, if you hurt yourself, you went to mum. If you felt unwell or were upset, you went to mum. Um, and she would give you the, the support and the there, 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 pat on the back kind of um, role. And they were also the person who had the predominant, the women were predominantly the child carers because, again, they gave birth to the child. Now, not everyone agreed with this, and as I've said, the feminists were very much anti this. But if we move on to talk about Elizabeth Bott, who was writing about the same time, she didn't agree with Parsons entirely. She said that there were two types or a polar opposite in terms of conjugal roles. And the term conjugal roles just means the roles played by the partners within a marriage or a cohabiting couple or an intimate relationship. And she said that there were two polar opposites. So in one regard, you would have families that had separate conjugal roles. And this would be the family where um, the couples would have an individual role within the family in terms of domestic labor. So it might be dad did the gardening and the DIY, mum does the in internal um, domestic labor, but also that the family would have individualized leisure activities. They wouldn't socialize 
as a family. They wouldn't socialise together. Maybe dad likes golf, mum likes going for a coffee, um, or mum's a runner and dad likes gaming. Um, but their, their roles within the family are very much separated. They're still a family. They still love each other and live together and in harmony and all that do that. But um, they have, they almost have separate lives. And it's very defined within the family as to who does what. At the other end of the spectrum, Elizabeth Watt talks about joint conjugal roles. And this is where she was talking about the fact that couples would have, would share the domestic labour. They may still have specific jobs that they would do, but they would, they might, they would be based on preference rather than biology. So to give you an example, in my older sister's home, my brother-in-law does all the ironing because he's a weird man who likes ironing. Um, don't get it myself, but there we go. Um, my sister does all the cleaning. Now, as she runs a cleaning company, that kind of makes sense. Um, my eldest niece does the majority of the cooking, um, but she's a catering college and it's a, it's a way for her to, to practice. But they still socialise together. They still watch, they sit down in the evenings and watch films together. They um, go out for walks together. They, they, they socialise together. They spend time together. Um, so it, there is that s suggestion that it, perhaps it's not changing, but we, we're seeing more people going towards that second, the joint conjugal roles. Wilmot and Young, however, have taken a slightly different view compared to Parsons and Bott, and they believe that families are becoming more equal. And they use the term symmetrical um, because they refer to this not just in terms of domestic position of labour, but also suggests that families are becoming more equal and democratic. They believe that there is a move away from the separate conjugal roles that Parsons um, identified and a move more towards conjugal roles. Um, but again, developed on the idea of Elizabeth Bott, where they suggest that instead of people having set tasks that they complete, things get done as they need to be done. So if somebody notices that the bins need taking out, they take them out. If the washing up needs to be done, they do the washing up rather than saying, oh, that's so-and-so's job. And they believe that with women going out to work, men have needed to take more of an active role in the family. And the, so there is more of a social um, norm and a more of a social um, requirement, if you like, for couples to spend time together. Now, there is evidence to suggest that this is the case. And, for example, there is acceptance of the interchangeability of roles and is accepted now with women working as well as men that when it comes to childcare, it's whoever can take the day off to look after a sick child will do it. It wouldn't automatically be the mother's role to do that. Um, we've got seven out of ten women of working age now in jobs. And with maternity and paternity leave changing, there's more of a push for parents to get back to work after a child is born, rather than one parent becoming a stay-at-home parent. Half of mothers with children under five work. Now, this could be seen as a financial necessity, um, but it's all, it can also be a choice. And we're seeing increasing numbers of men being saying that they are the main carer, that we have stay at home dads or dads who are becoming part time. And we're finding particularly that those sort of decisions that were traditionally made based on biology, as Talcott Parsons suggested, are now being made on financial or economic um, decisions rather than biological. So families will work out who it is that is the best person to go part time or to give up work. Um, in order to look after children who are preschool age and whether they can afford childcare or what the extended family can 
could help to provide when making these decisions rather than just saying well you're the mum you give up we work now although these changes are happening that this doesn't necessarily mean that this is a revolution in familial roles and responsibilities so we've got those three perspectives you've got the biologically determined roles from the Talcott Parsons you've got the middle ground with Elizabeth Bott and you've got the march of progress with Wilmot and Young so what we're going to look at now is why are the, these roles changing we've got evidence to suggest that the roles are changing but what is causing these roles to change now as we said before we now have economically active mothers women are going out to work so just because they've become a mother they're no longer expected to give up their job now in the 1930s 1920s it was actually written into a number of female workers contracts that as soon as they became mothers they would no longer be working for that company and um and that was a development on previous contracts which would say as soon as you got married you would no longer be working and and that was a, a reason not necessarily for dismissal but for leaving the company or leaving the job was because you got married or you had children and with women going out to work and being act economically active that need to do the housework has to be shared more equally between the partnerships another reason is the decline in extended family networks with fewer family members around what we see is that um, partners are going to have or um, spouses are going to have to help more equally around the house because you can't rely on granny and grandpa to look after the children um, while you're at work or for somebody to nip around with um, and do a the garden for you whilst you're at work so as we've become more isolated nuclear families and and um, dispersed extended families we're seeing that the roles in the family have to become more equal because there aren't the others to to ask um, for example my family live quite close to each other um, not near me um and it's not uncommon for one of my sisters to ring up my parents and go dad can you come and help with this usually some form of diy as my dad's builder um or to ring up um my little sister to ring up my older sister can georgina come and babysit for ozzy and all of please so my 17 year old niece babysitting for her cousins those sort of things are not necessarily available to all families when you live far apart I can't call up my dad and ask him to come and help me with any DIY around the house because he lives four hours away. Um, however, he has taught me well and I can do most things. Um, we've also got weakening gender identities. So as we've become more gender neutral in terms of our parenting and our expectations, we're seeing that um, these ideas of that's a woman's job in the home and that's a man's job in the home have very much weakened and these the biologically determined roles that perhaps Alcott Parsons was um, espousing in the 1950s really don't apply as much anymore because we, we're not considering that certain jobs are boys jobs and certain jobs are girls jobs we, we just kind of get on and do things technology and living standards we have got a lot more technology in our lives today which can mean that anyone can do the job um for example washing machines um i remember my grandmother getting her first washing machine when i was probably about five or six prior to that everything was hand washed and my grandfather wouldn't do it because he didn't want to mess it up and get it wrong um so that was always my nan's job because she knew what she was doing once they got a washing machine, it was a case of you can do it too. Turn the dial, press the button, job done. Um, same with dishwashers and um, garden um, tools such as lawn mowers, electric lawn mowers, much easier to use in a hand roller. Um, and now we've even got smart houses. 
So even some of the jobs that needed to be done previously are now done automatically. Things like your internet shopping. If you do your groceries online, you can make your list up over the course of the week using Alexa or Siri or whatever your um, format is. And then on a chosen day, that just gets sent off to the supermarket ready to be delivered. So we're seeing, and as our living standards have increased, so a lot of these jobs and lots of these chores are becoming are taken over by technology. Robot hoovers. Um, you can set you can set the timer off so they hoover while you're at work. Not a big fan myself. Can't quite work out how they get in corners and things like that. But works for some people. You can have um, you can control the lights and the heating in your home from your phone. You can get a smart plug that will turn the kettle on in the morning so your kettle's boiled by the time you come downstairs for your first cup of tea or coffee in the morning. So there's a lot of automation now in terms of domestic labour. Um, you've also got um, baby monitors that are cameras. I know my little sister has one in, in my niece and nephew's room and she will just say, Alexa, show me Orla's room and it will show her whatever Orla's getting up to if she's not sleeping in her bedroom. So there is this kind of more automation and, if you, if you like, surveillance within our lives, which has led to those changes in role. And finally, you've got the commercialisation of domestic labour. Um, with dual learning families, the, the, um, some of the time, particularly middle class families, can employ somebody to, be, to come in once a week to do the cleaning for them. They can, you can get somebody to do your laundry for you and, and do your ironing. You send it out on Friday, it comes back on Sunday, washed, ironed and hang up, ready to go in your wardrobe. It's expensive, but it's an option. Um, gardening services who come round once every month or so to mow your lawn. Um, as I said, with uh, online shopping, you put your order in, you go and collect it or it gets delivered to you. Takeaways. You don't even need to speak to anybody anymore because everything can be done by the internet. Thank God. Um, really don't like phone calls. But um, a lot of the, the there is this huge commercialization of domestic labor. You can get somebody to do the jobs you don't want to do. You, there's doggy daycares and dog walkers and things like that where people will come in and do those jobs for you whilst you're at work. If you've got the money to be able to pay for it, that is. So there's lots of reasons why roles are changing within the family and roles are changing in terms of domestic labour. And which one you think is the most important is up to you or which one has the most influence. But as we progress, as we move forward, we are seeing more equality within the family. Or so it seems. There are those who argue that the level of change in domestic division of labour has been exaggerated. And the British Social Attitudes Survey, one of the things that they generally ask about is how much time you spend on various domestic labour tasks. And this graph from um, the, pre the last domestic um, British Social Attitudes Survey shows that in the vast majority of cases, women are still doing the majority of the domestic labour. Not so much when it comes to gardening and pet care or maintenance and odd jobs, the DIY side of things that still seems to be the male domain, but women are still doing the cooking, the washing up, the cleaning and house cleaning, the laundry, the childcare, the ironing. These all appear that women are spending more time on that than men. And during the lockdown, studies have been done to to see whether or not the fact that people both cut both members of the family or both parents or spouses are at home during the lockdown, whether that changed things. And what they found actually was that it, the disparity actually increased. So despite both, both members of the um, couple working from home, women were still expected to do more of the domestic labour and the childcare if you had children doing home learning, women were expected to balance their job against the support of children home learning. So there is evidence to suggest maybe things are getting better, 
but the level of change has been exaggerated. Other evidence we have is the existence of the dual burden. Okay, so there are lots of studies who found that even in dual career families, women took a majority of responsibility for the domestic task. You've got Brainfield in 92, Ferry and Smith in 96, Manny Yee Khan in 2001, all of which showed that even when you have um, career families, you still women are still taking that responsibility for domestic labour. McKee and Bell in 1986 also found that even when men were unemployed, women still did the majority of the domestic labour and men actually resisted pleas from their partners to do more housework, seeing it as beneath them. So despite the fact that women were um, going out to work and maybe the breadwinner of the family, the men in their lives were still seeing um, housework as beneath them, even though they're at home all, in, all day unemployed. And that links into our second level of evidence, which is views on housework. And Rappaport and Rappaport in 1970 found that when women were talked about or when women were discussed, they weren't discussed in, in terms of their career, they were discussed in terms of wives and mothers, suggesting that there's still that biologically determined role that women are um, fulfilling, where their role as wife and mother supersedes their career um, achievements or attainments. Anne Oakley also um, found out that just because things are done jointly doesn't mean that they're necessarily done equally. She, uh, and she was very clear about this distinction because men, when asked about doing domestic labour in the home, they still see it as helping out their wives. They see it as they're, they're, they're doing their wives or their partners a favour rather than just doing something that needs to be done. So the distinction she makes is when they're seeing it as helping out, it's seen that it's jointly, joint domestic division of labour or joint conjugal roles. When it is, oh, I'm doing it because it needs to be done, that would be symmetry as put forward by Wilmot and Young. Okay. Now there's also um, David Morley who found that women often see the home as a, pla a second place of work whereas men see it as a place of leisure. So uh, women don't when women are asked about where, what they do in their leisure time, that tends to be outside of the home, going for a coffee, going for a walk, going for a run, um, going for a swim, um, being outside of the house and away from the family unit. Whereas men see their home as a place of leisure and being with their family as a form of leisure. And finally, we need to look at gay and lesbian couples because a lot of what we've talked about so far has been very heteronormative and focusing on heterosexual um, couples because the eras that they were written in and things like that. But with modern society, we've got a lot more gay and lesbian couples. And Dunn, who did uh, research in the early 2000s, found that gay and lesbian couples are more equal and symmetrical than heterosexual ones, probably due to the fact that they haven't got that biological um, limitation upon who does what, where and why. Um, but what, she, what was also found was that when there is unequal earning within the family, there is also unequal division of labour. So if one partner earns more than the other, then there is still um, differences in the domestic division of labour. So let's look at um, decision making. So we said that when we're talking about domestic division of labour, we're not just talking about housework. We are also talking about decision making in the family. And 
when we're talking about this, it, it can be that you can have domestically um, or, or housework equality, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there is um, equality in the decision making in the family. So Macintosh and Barnett suggest that women, uh, sorry, men gain more from unpaid domestic labour than they give back financially. So it, um, it's been suggested that if women were paid for the amount of domestic labour they did in a home, if they were paid for their, um, the housework that they um, performed, then they would be earning somewhere between an additional, um, an additional 10 to 12,000 pounds per year. Um, so that men are gaining this free labour and they don't necessarily give it back in, fine, in the amount of money that they bring into the house. But um, Paul and Volga talk about how this money management system can also be linked to decision making. So in equal households where there is more symmetry, you tend to see a pooling system where they ha there is maybe a joint account where a certain amount of money each month is put into that account to pay for all household um, outgoing bills, groceries, things like that. Um, and in some cases, you might find that all money goes into that one central account. In other cases, you put a certain amount in that covers the household cost, but you keep your um, anything left over is your money for you to do as you wish. You pay for your own credit card bills, you pay, you buy your own clothes, things like that. However, in unequal households, you might see more of an allowance management system where the um, where they have a central account where all money goes into that account, but the partner who earns more gives the other partner an allowance for the month for the, the household cost. And this was a system my parents had when I was growing up. My dad would give my mum housekeeping money for the week because my mum didn't work at that point. And she would use that money for shopping, um, for things that were needed around the house, groceries or school shoes and things like that for us. And it wasn't ever a case that if she needed more, she needed dad, she wouldn't get it, give it to her. But it was a case of, case of you're in charge of the household. Here's the money for running the household situation. You've then got Gashini and Laurie. I love sociologists' names. Um, Gashini and Laurie, who say that decision making is linked to earnings. The fact that the, the person who earns more, which predominantly is men, because we still have a gender pay gap in the UK of about 20%, um, means that whoever earns more is the person who has the, the majority of the decision making power. That's not to say that they make decisions unilaterally, but they will have more of a weight in terms of deciding who what what's going on. Edgel puts this into a little bit more um, distinct, obviously this came before Gashini and Laurie, but um, he said that there were three decision levels. The day-to-day -day decisions were often made by women. So these were things like what to have for dinner, what does the decorating in the household, food and clothing purchases, when you're going out, um, who you're going to see, things like that. The running of the day to day of the house tends to be the female domain and she can or and, and or the lesser earner of the family and they tend to be quite unilateral decisions. You've then got important decisions made jointly and these are ones that affect um, as a household. So they may be made as a household. So, for example, where you go on holiday, children's education, health decisions, whether or not you're going to get a dog or a cat or a pet. These sort of decisions, which are not necessarily life changing decisions, but they are important to the household. They might be made jointly between the spouses or they may be made as a family unit. And finally, Edgehill suggests that the uh, very important decisions tend to be made by the predominant earner, which in most cases is men. And these are life changing decisions, moving house, changing jobs, um, which school to send child to. These sort of decisions, which are life changing, tend to be made more with more weight towards 
the predominant earner or the man. And the feminist suggests that there are cultural explanations for decisions and that the system of decision making in the family is down to the type of society in which you live. We live in a patriarchal society, according to feminists, so therefore men have the power to make the decisions. In societies that are more matrifocal, the, the, the women make more of the decisions. But what we can see from all of these studies and these theories and these ideas is that um, decision making in the family is linked to earnings, but it also is still biological. That the patriarchy, according to the feminist causes, or leads to men having more power than women. But if, and also we've still got the gender pay gap, which means men are still the predominant earners. So even if the domestic division of labor, the domestic household chores appear more equal, decision-making hasn't quite reached the same levels yet.